All right. Uh, so we talk about Bitcoin main specifications. Now it is a good time to see how Bitcoin blocks are actually created, what kind of data is stored on the block and so on. So this picture is not com a complete picture, but it's just to give you an idea. So in a block, we actually have things like previous hash header, previous headers hash, timestamp, nonce, but also Merkle root, which actually hash value obtained from all of the transactions. So you can think this as a block header, and this is the block data, which consists of uh, transactions. But we take hashes of all of these transactions, then we take the payers and hash them again and again until to the top. And at the top, we call this as a Merkle root and include this in the header. And actually header is hashed to solve the cryptographic hash puzzle. So all of these previous hash values are hash values smaller than a, uh, the difficulty target. So these values start with a lot of zeros, okay? So uh, I said that this picture is not the complete picture because at the header, we also keep other data like difficulty target or version number and so on, okay? But this picture is good to visualize how things works, okay? So let's actually look uh, what kind of data we store on the Bitcoin block. So Bitcoin block structure actually consists of the following. Block size, we represent it with four bytes. Block header, we represent it with 80 bytes. Number of transactions, depending on the number, this can be as small as one byte or nine bytes, as much as, but then we, list the transactions, okay? But the rule is that the first transaction is always the coin-based transaction where the miner actually rewards itself, okay? So let's look at the header structure, okay? We said that it consists of 80 bytes. Let's see how this kind of, how kind of things that we store in 80 bytes. So the header start with the version number. It is four byte value, okay? Uh, when we update the software, generally we update this version number so that we can understand which miner using which version of the software, okay? So version is a good way to keep it. Previous block header hash, 32 bytes. Merkle root, again, this is a hash value, 32 bytes. As you can see, if you multiply this number with eight, you obtain 256 because we are using SHA-256. We have the time step in the Unix format. It is again four bytes. We have the difficulty target. So it is a you know encoded version of the difficulty target. We doesn't say a number saying that your hash value should be smaller than this, but we kind of encode that value in a smaller format. And we have the nodes, which is also four bytes. As you can see, all of these four bytes actually means 32 bits. So actually we are using unsigned integer values here. So think about C programming. Uh, when you say an unsigned integer, you get a 32 bit value. So for this reason, these values are actually little ending, okay? But uh, these hash values are stored as character arrays. So for this reason, uh, they are represented at internal byte order, okay? So this is a common thing happens in C programming. If you're familiar with C programming, you know that when you have an unsigned integer and try to store it as a character array, you will realize that the leftmost byte appears in the rightmost place in a character array, okay? So this internal byte order means that actually they are still little ending, but the leftmost byte goes to the rightmost place, the second leftmost becomes the second rightmost and so on. So this is important because when you look at the hexadecimal value of a block data, you would easily understand what is the version, you know, which part belongs to the previous uh, headers, hash value and so on, okay? Especially if you work as a forensics investigator. So now I'm going to talk about all of these values in detail. So version means that version number to track software and protocol upgrades. Previous block hash, hash of the previous block header. This is important. Uh, we are not hashing the previous block 
but the header, okay? Timestamp the moment the successful miner started hashing the header. Difficult to target the encoded version of the maximum value that the block's header hash must be less than or equal to. Nonce, 32 bit value miners can choose, okay? They try one by one. So let's look at the version number. Version number is to track software and protocol upgrades, indicates which set of block validation rules to follow. Since this determines what kind of software version you are using, this also tells you what kind of rules for the validation of the block. So version one is Genesis block in 2009. So if you again go to blockchain.com or anything, if you look at the first block, you will realize that the version is one, okay? So initially Satoshi said that let's keep the version as one. So in two, September 2012 with the Bitcoin core version 0.7, there was a soft fork. This software required block height parameter to be recorded in the Coinbase with BIP34. So this became the version number two, okay? So version number three became available in February 2015. Again, this is a software with the version 0.10. It required stick there encoding of all elliptic or digital signature, signatures in new blocks with BIP66. Six. You can look at this BIP if you want. Again, in uh, 2015, we had the version four. This actually provides the support for a new opcode called check lockdown verify with BIP65. But currently uh, there's an ongoing BIP. I think this is not finalized, but with this BIP, the representation of the versions will be might be different in the future. So a newer method called version bits is being designed to manage future soft forking changes. Okay, so in the future, you might see a different type of version numbers instead of, you know, one, two, three, or four, or five, you might see very different numbers due to this BIP. So if you're interested, you can go and look at it. So let's look at previous block hash. Hash of the previous block header, again, not the hash of the whole block. Chaining the blocks using the previous block headers hash provides security. Actually, this is why we call it a blockchain, right? Last time I talked about, you know, a Lego analog. And so, you know, putting a new Lego piece on top of the tower, actually you're including the previous piece there. So actually you are keeping the hash of it on the new Lego block, okay? So if you modify the, uh, a block in the past, its header will be different. Its hash of the header will be different. So once you modify it, for instance, if you go 10 blocks before and modify it, you have to come up with new 10 more blocks to you know, prove that you are the real blockchain. An attacker that changes a block in the past has to change every following block until the current one. Third uh, value in the header was timestamp. The moment the successful miner started hashing the header, represented as number of seconds from you know, 1 January 1970. This is the classic way of showing seconds in Unix format. But of course, this timestamp, you have some freedom here. Miners sometimes put a, you know, a future second, like 10 seconds in the future or something. So this way, they have more values to change in mining. Instead of nonce, they can you know change the timestamp. But if you put a, a timestamp that is very you know a few minutes in the future, and if you solve the puzzle, when you announce it, all of the uh, full nodes will reject it because your timestamp is something in the future. Okay, so it it gives you a, a little bit of freedom as a miner, but not something much. Okay. Difficult to target is it is in the encoded version of the maximum value that the blocks header hash must be. Miners aim to obtain a block header hash that is less than or equal to the difficulty target. Difficulty is updated every 2060 blocks, which is actually if you generate this number of blocks in 10 minutes, you multiply 10 with this number, okay, then divide it with 60. And then with 24, you will realize that the answer is two, which actually means that, sorry, you will also divide it. So the answer will be 14. Okay, you will, you know, if you generate every block in 10 minutes, it takes 14 days to obtain 2,060 blocks. That's what I'm trying to tell. So if everything 
uh, goes according to the plan, if you generate all of your blocks exactly in 10 minutes, two weeks later, you will generate 2016 blocks. So the software will check, you know, what is the new difficulty. And the new difficulty is old difficulty multiplied by actual time of the last 2016 blocks. So the software checks how long did it take to uh, obtain this 2016 blocks and divides it with this number multiplied by 10 because, you know, we ex expected this blocks to be generated in 10 minutes. We multiplied with 10. So again, if this number is one, then the new difficulty is the same as old difficulty. But if you uh, obtain blocks in a very fast way, for instance, half the value of this, then the result will be, you know, uh, something smaller. So you have to make the new difficulty two times harder. That is the whole idea. Okay, so difficulty increases if you solve the, you know, uh, uh, create the uh, blocks in a very fast way. And the inverse also happens. The, we don't say that the difficulty will be always higher. If, for instance, some miners leave the game, it will take more than 10 minutes to create the blocks. So a system will slow down for this many blocks, but at the end, the software will check that it took longer than 10 minutes in average to create the blocks. So the new difficulty will be easier than the old one. So that you know, things continue in an expected way. The fifth value is the nonce. 32-bit value miners can choose. Once every nonce is tried, miners should change the block data to continue mining. I will talk about this more in the mining section, but uh, People initially changing this 32-bit value was enough because initially the uh, puzzle was not that hard because we were mining with uh, CPUs, right? So for this reason, people, you know, go to back to 10 years older blog post and so on. And they say that miners try every nonce value to solve the puzzle, but trying every value, which is 32-bit value, takes less than a second, even on a GPU, okay? So miners actually modify a lot of different things. So this is just the beginning. So I will talk about them in the mining. So now that we talk about the structure, let's look at the genesis block. So in hexadecimal, the genesis block is something like this. Okay, here, th this is the version number. Okay, you know, hash of the previous block, which is, as you can see, zero because there is no previous block then uh, follows the hash of the current block, Merkle root, and then other data that we talked so far, okay? As you can see here, we also have the transaction data. And in the transaction data, this highlighted part actually tells the times 3 January 2009, Chancellor on bring of second bailout for banks, which is the header of the, the times of the you know, 3rd of January, 2009. So here, Satoshi actually showing that I mined this block exactly at 3rd of January because I couldn't know the headline beforehand. So I didn't press start mining. This is very important because Satoshi could do the following. So he created the first block in 3rd of January, but he could start mining two months earlier. You know, he could mine, for instance, thousands of blocks, but announce as the first block this day, okay? And fake that he did it 3rd of January. And at the following blocks, which he already mined two months ago, but in every 10 minutes, he could announce new blocks, right? This way, actually, he would have a head start. Here, he's proving that he he's not having a head start, okay? He is starting exactly as this date, and anybody joining to the mining will have the same rights like him. So, you know, he's trying to provide some kind of democracy here. Okay. So here is the actually the different, you know, formatted version of the block. As you can see, the first part is version, previous block, Merkle root, timestamp, bits, nonce, version, number of transactions one. First input, and this is previous output, secret length, 
script sig this is the signature sequence outputs so this is the reward for 50 bitcoins pk script length 42 and pk script actually in this part i guess he's including the you know headline from the times so this is how to you know decode this hexadecimal value as part of the you know header data and transaction data okay so these are at the end so genesis block is hard coded to the bitcoin core so let's look at the uh, block reward and mining genesis block reward so genesis block is hard coded to the bitcoin core once you download the software you know it is there so you cannot modify it so we agree on the starting point okay by including the new york times headline from 3rd of january 2009 satoshi proves that they didn't do pre-mining and have no head start okay some other cryptocurrencies were deliberately pre-mined in order to you know maybe collect a few million cryptocurrencies first then start the system so that they should have some kind of authority with that amount of cryptocurrency okay so if you visit some web pages they, which they list all of the current or previously uh, previous which are that you know cryptocurrencies you will see that if they are pre-mined or not okay so genesis blocks mining reward of 50 bitcoin was sent to this address you see it starts with one so it is paid to public key hash but those 50 bitcoin cannot be spent the reason is that when a node starts up it initializes its copy of the block database alongside the Genesis block and then begins the synchronization process. So when you start synchronization, actually you ask your peers and if they have newer blocks and so on. But for some reason, Satoshi decided not to add the Coinbase transaction from the Genesis block to the global transaction database. So when, if, you, if he wants to spend this money, actually, he cannot because all of the nodes in the network will reject that block because they it is not included in their transaction database. So something that this is an oversight. Maybe Satoshi forgot to add it. So this is one explanation. But since he spent a lot of time to show that he he's not he doesn't have a head start by putting the New York Times headline. My idea is that most probably Satoshi didn't want the head start. So he actually burned that 50 Bitcoins. So he's not going to spend that Bitcoin, 50 Bitcoin. So now a question is that since he cannot spend it, uh, he, he cannot also prove the identity of himself. Because if, some, if it was spendable, somebody who transferred this 50 Bitcoins to somebody, some different address, would mean that he's Satoshi or he knows the you know private key of this account. So you know we hear a lot of stories about people claiming that they are the Satoshi or something. So instead of coming up with these claims, they could simply transfer money from early mined blocks, not made for this block, but maybe the first block. Okay, because we also believe that the first or the following blocks also mined by Satoshi. So if you want to prove that you are Satoshi, you can simply transfer the rights of the you know, uh, Coinbase rewards uh, of the early blocks. So uh, since this cannot be spendable, some people wanted to check if Satoshi is around. So they send money to this account, okay? So if you go to a web page and check how much account this, this uh, wallet address has, you will see that so far there are more than 3000 transactions to this address so nothing you know spent from this but people sent around 18 because 50 bitcoin was the initially earned by the genesis block and uh, for more than 3000 transactions some people send money to this account but nobody withdraw them okay so there are 68 Bitcoin, so in the early days, this was nothing. But today, 68 Bitcoin is a huge amount of dollars, right? So uh, if Satoshi has this private key in the future, if he announces himself, he can withdraw 
18 dots, you know, 53 of these coins, but not the initial 51 because it cannot be spent. But the following transactions, since they are sent to this account after the Genesis block, the owner of this uh, address, the owner who has the private key can uh, transfer and send it to some place. So people deliberately did that to check if he is around, we will notice it, right? So this is the idea. So, okay, uh, we talked that the block size is one megabyte, but it is four megabytes virtually due to the SegWit soft fork. Blockchain size, when I checked in February 2022, was more than 380 gigabytes. So it increases linearly. So there's no problem with this. So as you can see in the last 13 years, we achieved 380 gigabytes, which can fit in almost any hard disk. And in the future, if even if this uh, blockchain exceeds this one terabyte, probably it will happen years later where buying a 10 terabyte hard drive would be something very cheap. So the storage currently is not a problem, but I'm not that sure about Ethereum these days. It's increasing faster than the Bitcoin. So, but also Ethereum developers are aware of the situation. So maybe in the future, they will come up with some update where they will you know, remove uh, unnecessary or all transactions or smart contracts so that the size will be something smaller. Block addition time, 10 minutes. All of these are, you know, uh, one megabyte block size and block addition time of time of 10 minutes was determined by Satoshi. So any change this, to this requires a hard fork. So the total Bitcoin amount, we said that it will be 21 million. This is also hard-coded by Satoshi. If you change this, this means that you again have a hard fork, okay? So currently Bitcoin in circulation uh, around 19 million. So most of the parts are already mined. And maybe since it is done in the past, maybe people who owns them died or their computer got broken. So they lost their private keys and so on. So maybe, uh, more than half of these bitcoins cannot be spent anyway. We are not sure. Okay, so, but 19 million of them are already mined. So there are only 2 million left. So this is why the price is increasing because, you know, there is a scarcity of this bitcoin. So this is why in the late years people got interested in. So this is why the price increased. Uh, so limiting it like this was to you know avoid inflation so this doesn't have to be like this so not every cryptocurrencies have a top limit for instance currently ethereum doesn't say that there will be at most this amount of ethereum in you know in the world so there's no uh, cap for ethereum and some cryptocurrencies increase this number to billions or something so they value this for this reason is sometimes small, like a few cents and so on. So uh, we don't know why Satoshi chose it as 21 million, but we are always assuming that maybe his dream was to have that $1 will be one Bitcoin at some point. So there will be $21 billion worth Bitcoin in the world. But nowadays, since a Bitcoin is more than $40,000, so... Uh, this amount of Bitcoin actually costs a lot more. And we don't know what will happen in the future. It might increase or it might decrease. We will see. So current mining reward is 6.25 Bitcoins. I said that in, at the Genesis block, it was 50. Uh, then it's in almost every four years, it's got halved. We will talk about them in the, in the following slides. So this way, uh, at the end, whenever we reach 21 million, the reward will be zero. So at that point, miners will only get the transaction fees. So any change in these specs causes a hard fork, okay? Changing any of these, you know, four years or the reward or the total amount of Bitcoin block addition time or the block size causes a hard fork. So in forking, we will talk about them. For instance, Bitcoin Cash increased this one megabyte to 32 megabytes and created a new cryptocurrency. 
adding a cryptographic algorithm causes a soft fork. We already talked about this when we talk about Schnorr signatures. This is how you obtain a soft fork. So uh, let's finish with the slide this part. When you want to investigate Bitcoin data, you, you can have a lot of online tools. Actually, you can check the blogs. For instance, many services can be used to access cryptocurrency data. For instance, if you know the transaction ID, hash of that transaction, you can you know, look at the web. For instance, I, we just looked at the Genesis blog. You take this transaction ID and put it here you know, for the blockchain info web page. If you don't write that you want it in the hexadecimal notation, it actually, as far as I know, gives you something in JSON format, which is actually easy to read. But if you want the hexadecimal block data, you can have it like this, and then you can put it in any software to check what it looks like as readable characters. For example, if you want to look at the Genesis block transaction, you could just follow this link and it will give you the hexadecimal value. You know, in the previous slides, I put it in the hex reader. So you can also get that block data. I'm saying this because you don't have to keep the whole blockchain on your computer to investigate what is going on in the blockchain, okay? You can use this kind of web pages to look at each transaction. If you want to check a balance of an account, for instance, this is the, uh, Satoshi's Genesis block account where he received 50 Bitcoins for the reward. So you can follow this and you will see that there are, you know, 68 dot something Bitcoins on this account. So if you want to only check unspent transactions, you just spend, change this part instead of balance, you write here unspent. So I'm saying this because if you're a forensics investigator, you have to know how to check things, right? But although you have this kind of online tools, you cannot use them on the court because you cannot say that I use this web page and they told me that there is this transaction there. In order to do that, you have to have a copy of the blockchain yourself, have the block data there, and you have to know how to investigate it, okay? This is why I told you the structure of the Bitcoin block, you know, how the version number is encoded, how the you know, previous hashes encoded and so on. So this is why uh, it is important to read the little and in or a little byte order and so on and so forth, okay? So forensics investigator should be able to extract the same data from the blockchain itself. This is what I'm trying to tell. So if you want to investigate something, you can use these web pages, but there are also software that you can use. But at the end, if you want to use it on the court, you should have to obtain it yourself, okay?